To, uh, to spend a few minutes going through these uh, ABCs, you got them on your handout, and uh, this is just kind of a, a quick way to remember how to apply these principles. And basically, what I'm trying to say here is that these three principles: accept, balance, and clarify, sum up everything that's on this page. Okay, so this is our screen. We can go through this and. Evaluate, you know, are these conditions present? Are they going through this process? Uh, am I taking on this role? And is this is what I'm focusing on improving myself? You can look at each one of those and, and kind of do a self evaluation or a program evaluation. Uh, but if you want to just be quick and figure out what's needed right here and you got to act, think ABC, accept, balance, clarify. Okay? Uh, I've used these principles for a number of years now. I do a lot of uh, training and consulting and teaching in stress management. I use them for that, but I've also used them working with uh, groups of people with chronic pain, um, use them with couples and families, use them with parenting, uh, and find that the same principles 
apply again and again and again. And really, they're the principles that have guided me in, in a lot of the work I've done with the Hard Times Cafe. Um, I have them in the order of ABC just because they're easy to remember, because it's the first letters of the alphabet. But the first one that I think of is balance. Okay? Everything is easier when you're in balance. Everything is harder when you're out of balance. And balance applies in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay? Uh, the first, and, and in some ways the most important, is just in terms of being balanced when you're in your own life, in terms of your stress levels, not feeling pressured, not being in a hurry, um, and being focused on and clear about where you're going and what's going on. Okay, so you need some balance between rest and activity, you need balance between work and pleasure, you need balance between time alone and time with other people. And I've tended to be a, a very high stress person much of my life, which is how I got into the stress management thing, trying to figure out how to deal with it. Um, and when I'm out of balance, I quickly lose my effectiveness. And I've even learned to cancel appointments if I'm doing counseling that day. If I'm really out of balance or stressed out, I am no good to my clients. Okay? And um, let me just go into this now. There are, there are really, let me talk about how stress affects us and, and, and some real simple things we can do about it because it, it really makes a difference. Okay? If, you're, if you're really pushing yourself and you say, I got to do this or I should make this happen, it's not going to happen. With the empowerment process. You have to be grounded and moving at a steady pace for empowerment to happen, for it to, 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 to grow and, and to, to, to foster. And there, there are three parts to this, three ways that we get out of balance, the three ways that stress affects us. Okay? It affects our, our mind, our body, and our emotions. And it's really helpful to know what's happening with each one of those. Can everyone see this? Is this blocked by the screen? It's really helpful to know what's happening to your mind, to your body, and to your emotions when you're under stress. Okay? Um, let me start with, with the mind. Okay? When we're under stress, we tend to focus more narrowly. Okay? It's a physiological process. Okay, you actually lose your peripheral vision when you're under stress. Okay, so if I'm relaxed, okay, I can still see my fingers. Okay, I can see them wiggle. Okay, now if I tense up, now I can see them. Okay, pretty significant difference just with a, just an intentional thing. Okay, um, but that becomes unconscious, not in the sense that it's some Freudian thing going on but in the sense that we're unaware of it. That when we're under stress, when our body's under stress, our mind takes in less information. We become less receptive. We become more active, more driven, more narrowly focused, okay? So it's just like this. As the stress levels increase, this is what happens to our focus, okay? And the focus tends to be on the source of the stress, okay? And now if the stress is coming from different things, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, then we can scatter. But if there's one big stressor, okay, one big should hanging over us or something like that, as we get more and more stressed out, as we fail to take account what we need to do to balance, it starts to become like this, okay? And now I'm seeing mostly my hand and just occasionally a person off the side, and it can even get to the point where it gets like this, okay? Where you're just walking around, you bump into stuff, okay? You don't even see where you're going, okay? Um, I call it delusions of adequacy. <laughs> In a sense, you think you know what you're doing, but you're really missing the boat because you're not taking in information. Okay, and I'll explain how this works when I'm talking about what happens to your body because it really is a physiological process. Okay, you don't see the larger picture. Okay, so the stress is here. There might be a solution right here, and I don't see it because I'm focused on here. Okay, and you're driven. Okay, so your, your ability, again, to take in information, to be receptive, is greatly diminished. Diminished to the extent that you're out of balance. And it's a physiological process. Okay? Um, I'll just give you a quick example. I've been building my own house now for seven years. Um, first year, we lived in a mobile home, and I worked on a basement. We lived in a basement for three and a half years, and I 
finished the first floor and now I'm working on the second floor. Um, of course, my kids are going to say they don't need their own bedrooms yet. They'll be done in a couple of years. But I was at a point where um, we were working on a basement and um, I had a wood stove that I hooked up. We didn't have any other kind of heat. And it was getting cold and I, needed, I had some friends coming over to help me um, put up some drywall or to finish it. And I needed to get a ceiling fan hung up to circulate the heat around the whole basement so that, so that it would set up properly. And I came home from work and I had about 45 minutes before I had to go to a meeting and I thought, uh, if I really hurry, I can get that fan up. If I hurry, I can, I can put it up and I really need to rest because I've got this meeting and I'm tired from working all day, but I'll hurry and get the fan up and then I can, you know, I have to be off the next day to, to get the drywall set. So I got the fan up on the ceiling and just went to my meeting. I came home late from the meeting and I went down to build a fire in the stove so it'd be nice and warm in the morning and I noticed that I had hung the fan directly above the wood stove. Ooh, I wonder if that's a problem because it's basement, it's a low ceiling. And I called my neighbor, who used to be a maintenance man for Dow Chemical, and he said, Yeah, you've got to move the fan. You're going to burn it up. It's too much heat for the motor to be able to handle it. Okay, now it's 10 30 at night. I'm tired. I've worked all day. I've been to a meeting. I've got to move the fan over. Now, how far do I have to move it over? I call my neighbor back. And I think that. to ask the first one. So I call him back up. And he says, You've got to move it this far. So I measure that far figure out where to go, and there's no electrical circuit running through there, and I don't want to drill through it because my stove's going in the same place upstairs, and I want to wait over places where there's holes in the, in the joist. So I ran a whole separate circuit that didn't fit into my electric plan, and got the thing up. It's well after midnight. It works. I fire up the stove. The guys come the next day, and we get the job done. My wife comes home from work, comes to check on the progress, and says, why'd you hang it there? Because what I had done was move the fan that far away from the stove. Okay? I hadn't thought about, well, this is going to be our living room, and where would be a nice place to move the fan? Okay, so I took the fan down again and moved it over to where it's now still hanging. Okay? But that's what happens to our mind under stress. Okay? We narrowly define what we should do right now. Get the fan on ceiling. Okay? Move the fan over. Okay? We don't stop back and think, now, what's this going to look like? month from now when we're all done. Where do we want the fan to We don't think long term to the extent that we're out of balance. Okay? And I hear a lot of people say when I do stress seminars, I spend all my time putting out fires. Okay? I don't do any long term planning. I'm just reacting all of the time. And that's what happens when you get into a stress mode. Everything becomes a reaction. You don't see things in terms of a perspective. Everything is two dimensional, black and white, and coming at you fast. Okay? To the extent that you're in balance, you can see things in perspective, set some clearer priorities, keep your feet on the ground, and notice the consequences of things and, and, and make some clear decisions. Okay, so balance is a, is a real critical thing. And I'm recognizing that myself because in August, I got out of balance and I'm still not quite caught up yet. Um, my computer broke down and, and I have two other jobs besides this one, and I spend an awful lot of time every day I use it, and so I spent a week trying to fix it and then just bought a new one. And then that one wasn't working right. I spent a lot of time and got behind and everything. I was trying to get caught up and had a vacation planned. And I always push myself into vacation. Then I relax on vacation. The vacation fell through. Um, so I never did get back to balance. And, and all these people can tell you how they've struggled putting up with me during the last six weeks. That I've become more more pushing, uh, more, more trying to make things happen rather than listening and taking in, less creative in terms of um, picking up the solutions whole lot less sensitive in terms of picking up stressors when they get a little big and checking in on people and seeing what's going on. And, you know, instead of recognizing when they come this big, you know, coming at the football uh, right at me, um, just a lot of things that are simply a result of being out of balance. Uh, and I don't think that you can do empowerment and be out of balance. It's a real critical thing. If you're in a hurry to help someone empower, you know, it's just not going to work. Because of what happens to your mind and your to process information and take it in. Okay? Our mind does not work under pressure in a creative, empowering way. It works in a controlling way. Our tendency under stress is to try to take control and make things happen. You won't help someone with power. And it's a physiological process. It's not something you can make a decision, well, I'm out of balance and I'm still going to do this. I mean, you can dip into your socks sometimes and really listen to someone and work at it, but it's going to put you more out of balance to do so then you got more time to make it. And once you get out of balance, it cycles on itself. 
because you'll do things that will make it even more difficult to keep going. Okay? So I start with balance. Because if, if I'm out of balance, I'm not worth much. And if the person I'm working with is out of balance, okay, which often happens when people are experiencing hard times or they've been disadvantaged uh, for any period of time or they're experiencing a crisis, you know there's a sense of imbalance. So they're going to be more reactive. They're going to be less receptive. They're going to be less likely to listen to you. Okay? And so what's needed at that time is some space. And the question I ask myself is, is what's one thing that can help them to, to get more into balance, take a step in that direction of feeling they have some support when they're not alone or something like that. Okay. Balance applies in a whole bunch of other ways, too. One of the most important is the balance in a relationship. Okay? There needs to be a balance of control in a relationship. Um, in a way, it's, it's a tricky position trying to be a facilitator because my role is advisor. I have no authority uh, for the program. Um, but I need to call people on things when it seems like it's going in a direction that's not helpful. I need to keep that large picture and a sense of that direction. But I also need to balance that between giving people feedback and calling them on things, between reinforcing their initiative and supporting them and, and giving them positive strokes too. Okay, so there's a balancing act in there. Okay? You have to look at the effect of what you're going to say to someone. Okay? And that's another thing about Hard Times, uh, the Hard Times Cafe, is that we need to call people on everything. Okay? When someone is not being responsible or dealing with it, they need to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with. Okay? We need to be open about that. And we'll get into that in, in, in one of the process of becoming an effective helper. It's a lot easier to let things slide and to, to move aside, but you need to have a balance about that openness. You can't just open it up and give real direct feedback sometimes. You have to look at the whole picture and look at the person in the context of what's, of what's happening and try to find some balance in that. So you need a balanced perspective. Balance in terms of control of the situation and authority and balance within yourself and awareness of how the other person may be balanced. Okay. So balance is a lot of limitation. Any questions about balance? Okay. Accept. There's two parts to acceptance. Okay. The first part simply means accepting the reality of the situation, okay? This is what's real. It's letting go of should. It's not talking about what should be or what ought to be happening or any of those things. It's talking about this is what's here right now. And that doesn't mean that, that it's acceptable or that it's okay. It just means that it's real, okay? So going off here and saying, well, our county is a poor county and the government should give us more money and they should provide some jobs and all of this thing takes us nowhere. Okay? Um, it just gets us stuck in something else. Okay? The first meeting there was a lot of anger about people losing their assistance because many people were facing foreclosure and eviction and things like that in terms of what should happen or should not happen that was just simply not a direction that had any benefit for us question is, what's here right now? This is what we've got, so what have we got to work with? Okay. I don't have the understanding or the skills to, to change government, and, and I think it's a, once it changes, it's going to change again four years later anyway, most likely. So I, I look at that as a real kind of long-term sort of thing. And you really need acceptance to look at what's here right now, because you can get stuck on any number of issues about what should be happening. Okay. Um, the other part of acceptance is that people need to feel accepted. Okay, and you'll notice that this word is in here, uh, implied and spelled out. It's here in terms of the conditions for improvement, and also right at the bottom line in terms of the role of helpers. Okay, is to accept other people. You need to feel accepted, and helpers need to accept those that they're working with. If you don't feel accepted, you put up a wall. Okay. Any time that you don't feel accepted, there's this wall that goes up immediately and you become defensive. Okay? And then you wind up relating to this wall and not to the person underneath. And if you're talking in terms of empowerment, okay, it has to be person to person. It comes out of the process of the relationship. You can't empower someone who's behind a wall. Okay? And that's just our natural tendency. Anytime we don't feel accepted, we defend ourselves. And there's a lot of ways that we can communicate uh, that non-acceptance. Let me just give you one example about uh, 
acceptance. Um, I worked with a, a woman once, she was a grandmother, and uh, she was also a college student, she was studying psychology, and um, she had had a very difficult life, And uh, but right now her immediate concern was that her, her um, she had a three-year-old grandson that she said was her reason for living. That this, this you know, she might have killed herself is what she meant when she got there for this little boy because she gave her so much pleasure and she just loved being with him. And her daughter had just said that she didn't want her to see, she didn't want her mother to see the child anymore. And no more contact with them. Okay. So she came into counseling and we tried to look at the situation. And basically what had happened is that uh, grandma was stuck taking all these psychology classes and parenting things and reading a lot of books and, and it was real clear that spanking was against the rules. Okay, spanking a child teaches a child to deal with conflict and violence and a whole bunch of good rationale for that. Um, and every time she was with mom, mom would wind up spanking the little guy for some reason or another. And she said, you know, imagine how much she spanks him when I'm not around. You know, she spanks him that much when I am around. Okay. Um, so we talked about this principle of acceptance. Okay. And what she realized was that um, by putting this should on her daughter that she shouldn't spank, she was actually probably leading to him being spanked more because she was creating stress for her daughter, she was getting more reactive, and then she'd be more likely to take control and spank when she was angry and reactive than if she had been <coughs> more relaxed and able to look at other situations. So the actual process of putting pressure on it was having the opposite effect. Okay? It just simply wasn't working. And when you see that, it's hard to continue that. Okay? But still there was the issue of the relationship. And she also understood and it became clear that um, the problem in the relationship was her daughter wasn't feeling accepted. Okay, and she was being pushed away. Okay, and that her parenting wasn't accepted. And it's like, you know, who are you to tell me how to mother with your mother and you know, all this stuff going on? And so I asked her to come up with an excuse where she would have to have to see her daughter for some reason and then focus on some way that she could communicate that acceptance. Okay, how can you help your daughter to feel accepted? What can you do? Um, what can you say to her? And she said, well, I could tell her she's a good mother. I said, well, do you believe that? She said, no, she's a terrible mother. She spends her kid all the time. Okay. Well, it has to be true. It has to be honest. Okay. And she finally came up with, you try really hard to be a good mother. Okay. She finally got to that and said, that's true. I can say that. So I said, say that at the end of whatever you meet about, just as you're leaving, say, you know, you try really hard to be a good mother. Just plant that seed. Okay, and then let it go and see what happens. My next appointment was in two weeks, and she was back seeing her grandson. And she planned on the scene a few days later, her daughter called her back for no reason, and she tried to continue that atmosphere of acceptance, and the walls fell down. Okay, so they can totally close off a relationship or open up a relationship in the process of acceptance. Okay? And when you're not feeling accepted, and you're not accepting the reality of the situation, you don't have any sense of empowerment or ability to do anything about it. You feel stuck. You feel like you're going nowhere. Okay. Any questions about acceptance? Um, accepting the reality um, sometimes meaning means accepting difficulties as well in another person and talking to them about that. It doesn't mean um, always being on their side. Okay. It doesn't mean um, going along with everything they say. It doesn't mean trying to be liked. Okay? We all like to be liked. We all like to think that the people we're helping like us. Uh, but I think that's a false goal. And it interferes with the power. If your goal is to be liked, it's better to join some social club or something else. I don't think working with disadvantaged people is a good way to meet that goal. Uh, because people won't always like what we have to say. People need to hear feedback in order to continue to grow and improve. And none of us are really feeling wonderful when we get feedback that, that isn't positive, you know, when we're asked to change something or look at something in ourselves. It's real tempting when someone is giving us a story that, that someone is <coughs> doing something to them to take their side and say, oh, yeah, you need to, you know, this person is the problem. Okay? But what empowerment means is what can you do about that situation? So my friend is treating me this way, or my boss is treating me this way, or something like that. It's real easy to join with that person and say, "Yeah, your boss is a real, is a real nothing." 
doesn't know what he's doing or that she's just out to lunch. Okay? That's the easy way, and we can feel like we're side to side and we're together. But the empowerment way and using acceptance is, well, that seems to be where your boss is right now. What can you do about it? How can, how can that situation be changed? How can we understand where this person is coming from so we can maybe start to change them? That's empowerment. Okay? So it's, it's a lot trickier and a lot more difficult and a lot less comfortable. And then the third is to clarify. Clarify is another word that uh, Hard Times Cafe patrons, particularly early in the program, heard a lot. You always got to clarify. You got to clarify things. Clarify basically means looking at things from different perspectives. You take the whole broad view and you try to look real long term where you want to go. You narrow right in and you get real specific from the words that you're using. Okay? We're very careful about the words. We don't have any supervisors at Hard Times Cafe. We don't have any directors. Okay? We call our board the Board of Trustees. We call these people elders. We don't call them directors. We don't call them supervisors. Okay? Our coordinators are coordinators, not managers. Okay? Our coordinator coach is a coach, not a supervisor. Okay? We're very specific and careful so that we're not sending <coughs> a message that we don't intend. Okay? And clarifying is being clear about the message you're sending. It's also being clear about what's most important, what the priorities are, and focusing on that. Um, it means asking a lot of questions. Okay, and getting down to what people meant to say rather than what they said and how that was heard <coughs> by the other person. Okay. It's a continuing process of clarifying. So those are the kind of the underlying principles. If you want to sum all of this up <coughs> in three words, you can try the A, B, C. And in any given situation, that will help you move towards the problem. Okay. Hello. Any questions about the ABCs? If we have some time, um, either this afternoon or tomorrow before we close, I'd like to apply these to some situations. If you have a problem situation or, or a, you know, something you can even just make up. We can apply them and run through some examples like that. Dignity, as I said this morning, is something we're simply born with. It's not something you have to earn or something you have to accomplish or something that's given to you. It's something inherent in every person. It's something that, that we recognize and feel within ourselves in contact with other people. And the nature of our relationship communicates whether there's dignity or not dignity. Okay? Every time we communicate to someone we send a message about the nature of our relationship. Okay? Every time we say something, like if someone just observed this meeting, the nature of my relationship is, a, is as a, a teacher or a presenter right now. Okay? And they see these people up here, and their nature of their relationship is they're experts. They have experience in the area that we're talking about. Just by, even though they're not saying anything right now, just by their actions and how they're sitting, they're saying something. And the, the, the tone of your voice and all kinds of different ways communicating something about the nature of the relationship. Okay. And so paying attention to that and always choosing the side of focusing on someone's dignity. Okay. Um, there's a kind, and, and perception is everything in this. Okay. I may think I'm treating someone with great dignity, but if they don't perceive it that way, then it's having the opposite effect. Okay. And I want to spend some time in a minute just talking about perception. But uh, first, I want to talk about a, a kind of thinking that I think interferes with empowerment and with this sense of dignity of each individual. Because it's a very personal thing, the dignity. Okay? You don't have to have dignity in a sense. It's an individual, personal thing. And we're, 
we're trained from kindergarten, preschool, all the way up through college and graduate school to think objectively. Okay? Objective thinking is, is what we're trained in how to do to deal with objects. Okay? And that's a pretty clear, simple way of thinking in most, for the most part. And if you look at technology, how much we've advanced technologically just even over the last five years. I mean, I, I read an article yesterday where, where they're looking at in two or three years it might be possible to perform surgery on someone in another country. That you can hook them up to a robot that's hooked up to a telephone and the doctor with a virtual reality device can actually perform surgery on that person when they're in a van somewhere in another country. You have someone in the United States operating on someone who's on a battlefield somewhere that has a cellular phone. I mean, it's incredible the technological advances and how far we've come with all of this. Okay? Technologically, we're very advanced. Okay? You could also make a good point that in terms of human relationships, we might be going in the other direction. Okay? If you look at divorce rates, and, and you look at violence, and you look at drug abuse, and you look at breakdown of the family, and breakdown of the community, and isolation, and things like that. In terms of human relationships, we're not doing very well. Okay? And I think this is related to how we think. Okay? We're trained to think objectively and technologically. We're not trained to think in human terms. And let me give you an example. Okay? This yardstick is an object, okay? And I can flip it around, I can hand it to Pat, and we can hand it to Ernie, and Ernie can hand it back to me, and I can try to balance it, okay? Yeah? And it's still the same yardstick, it has not changed, okay? Put it in my pocket, okay? Take it out, I just was in a storeroom probably somewhere this morning, and now it's here in this hand. It's still the same yardstick. All of these numbers on it are the same, the spaces between the numbers, it's exactly the same. And objects are like that. Objects stay the same. Okay, I could take this to, to Europe with me. If I were going to Europe, bring it back, it'd still be the same yardstick. I can break it or something. Okay? Objects remain the same, they're consistent, you can depend on them. Okay? I can make a category and say this is a yardstick and talk to someone on the other side of the world and say, I have a yardstick in my hand and they know what I was talking about. Okay, they know it's 36 inches long and then it had 36 numbers on it with a bunch of lines in between they know exactly what I was talking about. Okay, yardstick, just simple. Okay, object. Now, humans are not objects. And to the extent that we treat them as objects, we diminish that dignity. Okay? Human thinking and human interactions is more like a liquid. Okay? You just poured some water in your cup. Okay? I'll do the same thing. This water right now has the shape of the container, okay? of the pitcher. And now I pour the water in the cup, and look what's happened. It's changed shape. Okay? It's a different shape than it was in the pitcher. Depends on where it is. Okay? You take one person and you talk to them in their home, you talk to that same person in another situation in your office or in a store or someplace else, you're going to get a different response. Okay? It depends on the context. Okay? You're going to talk to the same person when they're under stress, you're going to get a different reaction when they're very relaxed. It depends on the situation. Okay? If I drink the water, it takes the shape of my esophagus, and now it's in the shape of the bottom of my stomach. Okay? Or the food that's sitting on there. Okay? It depends on the situation. If I pour it on the floor, it takes the shape of the floor. Now what happens to my yardstick if I mix it up with a pencil? Okay? I mix it around, I mix it up with a pad of paper, it doesn't change. Okay? My chalk broke into three pieces, but it's still essentially chalk. It doesn't change. Okay? What happens to this? If I mix one liquid with another, I've got a different liquid. Now I have, I used to have lukewarm coffee, and now I've got cool diluted coffee, weak, very weak coffee, okay? And I can't get my water back again. And I can't get my coffee back again. I have changed the nature of this substance, okay? I would have to work real hard and boil it away, and even then it's going to change. So I'm never going to get exactly back what I had before. So these categories are continually changing, okay? So if I'm in an empowerment way of thinking, and I'm focusing on someone's dignity, I am changed with every interaction that I have with every one of those people. Okay? 
and to the extent that I think I can remain myself and stay the same and that that's a fixed thing, I'm missing out on some dignity that's out in front. Because that's the extent at which I'm responding to an object or an objective category rather than a living, changing person. Okay? So I'll call that human thinking rather than objective thinking. So our mind, our mind likes things consistent, okay? Our mind likes to set up categories for things, okay? It's much more efficient. Our mind is described as a self-organizing system, okay? Brain scientists will describe it in that way, okay? It's, it's, it takes in information and organizes itself based on the information, but it creates categories. So everything your mind does, like I just heard that information, I create a category pouring water in glass. Instant. Okay, he poured himself some water. I made that category in my mind. And what happens is it's like a funnel. Okay? So I hear that sound. Well, that sound is probably towards the middle. It drops down the funnel. I hear another related sound. I'm going to want a category for that sound. Think of yourself at night and you hear a noise. Okay? You hear, um, you hear a um, kind of a rumbling sound. Oh my, what's that noise? As soon as you got a category for, oh, that's the furnace coming on because the pipes are cold. Boom, it goes down into here, you're okay. okay. Our mind seeks out those categories, but something way over here, if your funnel's big enough, and way over here can have the same category. Okay? And empowerment thinking is a process of letting go of those categories and creating different categories. Creating new categories. A good example of how our mind works is. Um, it's my neighbor's uh, backyard. He used to have a big sand pit in his backyard. And um, he got a bulldozer and he smoothed it all out. He has a nice smooth hill right now. Okay? But when he first did that, after it rained, there were a whole bunch of little rivers coming down that hill. Okay? And then it snowed and the snow sat on it. And then when the snow melted, the snow made all those rivers deeper. Okay? And all the water goes back down the same rivers again. Okay? That's what our mind does. Okay. It creates the category, it creates the way of thinking, and our tendency, and it's even greater when we're more out of balance and more in stress, is to move down the same rivers. Okay? But with empowerment thinking and choosing to focus on everyone's dignity, we need to be able to switch rivers. Okay? The more stress we're under and the more established we are in our way of thinking, we think that the whole world is this river. That's how we're perceiving it. But there are many other ways to perceive the same thing. Okay? And the real key is to be able to back up and look down another river. And back up and do that mentally. And to scan and look sideways. And when we do that, then we can really help the people that we're with to realize their dignity and to be themselves. But to the extent that we put someone into category, um, we can diminish their dignity and do a real fast. Real fast. This person is schizophrenic. Oh, we got a category. There's a woman who's, who's um, schizophrenic who wrote this very lengthy list of everything that's wrong with the Hard Times Cafe, and it was kind of rambling and it was real hard to follow. Um, she was real concerned about it. She came into the elders. Um, it's real easy and tempting to say, oh, she's schizophrenic. What the elders did, and what they're very good at, was clarify, clarify, clarify. And after about 15, 20 minutes, we came up with a real concrete suggestion about how to improve uh, how we were providing transportation to our fundraising events. And they developed a system to take care of that problem. Okay, so there was this confusing kind of a thing, but within that, by having the trust that everyone has something to offer and in every situation there's an opportunity, and really focusing on that rather than on the category, it would be real easy to say, oh, this person's schizophrenic. I don't even think people knew that necessarily. Okay? But what you do is you clarify the key to it if something comes out of it. Okay? So that's a different, a different way of, of thinking. Okay? Um, little things that we do in terms of the dignity. We always celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. We get a song and, and applause when we have a birthday or an anniversary. And, and just greeting people at the door and the fact that we serve them and that you don't stand in line. Um, when Battle Creek opened their program, which is based on the Hard Times Cafe model, uh, we went down to 
to help them on their second meeting. And the night before, I went to a number of uh, places, to sh homeless shelters, and, and then I went to uh, soup kitchens and things like that the next day. And everyone was always standing in line. And I came to the Hard Times Cafe, and they just automatically went and started standing in line again. Okay, we won't let anyone stand in line at the Hard Times Cafe. We bring you and we give you a place to sit and, and make you feel like you're in an expensive restaurant and you're being treated like your best customer. Okay, that's our goal with each one of our patrons at the Hard Times Cafe, to really focus on that dignity. Um, there's a lot of unintentional ways we can diminish people's dignity, giving you a form to fill out that's difficult to understand, okay, being in a hurry and saying, here, do this, okay, we're going to create those categories and do those kinds of things. Anticipating someone's questions, finishing their statements for them, all of those things diminish the dignity. Focus on that. The next is the potential for improvement. Okay. I mentioned that there are a lot of different ways to perceive any person or any situation. Okay. The bottom line is there is no objective reality in terms of human relationships. There is no way you can prove what's happening in a relationship because it's totally dependent on how human beings perceive it. Okay. There is no single one. We can all agree that this is a yardstick, although someone might say it's a, a one, slightly less than one meter long piece of wood. We can all agree on that. Okay? But in terms of relationships, it has to be filtered through how we perceive it. Okay? And since we don't have anyone who's not human that we can relate to, we can't come up with an objective thing. It's dependent on how we focus on it. Okay? And what I've learned in, in counseling is that you can choose your perceptions to suit your needs. I mean, I can't choose to perceive that, you know, I can run a mile in two minutes because I can't, okay? But I can choose to perceive how I interpret a certain interaction or something like that, okay? I can, I can interpret um, somebody as uh, out to get me, out to make a hard time for me, out to make things difficult for me. I can interpret the same situation as someone being under a lot of stress and struggling and being reactive. Now, how I respond to each of those interpretations can be very, very different. Okay? We choose to perceive people in a certain way at the Hard Times Cafe. We choose to focus on their potential for improvement. Okay? Their potential, their, their inner sense of, of dignity and, and, and what they have in them that has value. And every single person has value somewhere in themselves. And the job and the part of the model is to find that help it to grow. Um, there was a um, field in front of my yard, and I had, it, uh, had a bulldozer kind of level it out when I, when I had the landscaping done. And uh, there was a big pile of clay that was moved out. So the clay got stripped off, and there was no topsoil. It was just hard pan clay. And nothing at all grew there for the first three years out of it. It was just total weeds to new growth. It was total hard pan clay, and in the summer, more cracked. Like a, like a desert, and, and uh, just stayed there. Nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, two summers ago, there was this incredible explosion of these oxalis daisies, these big white flowers. I've never seen them so big, and there were the plants were like this big around and this tall. They just exploded out of there. Okay, and what happened was the conditions were right for them to for them to grow. Whatever those seeds needed or wherever those plants came from, I don't know. But for years, nothing happened and then the conditions were right and they exploded and grew. Okay. So what we try to do is to set up the conditions and make things happen, but to recognize within every person there is that flower inside. There is a special beauty that's everyone's gift. Okay. And also to understand the pain and the difficulty that they've been through. So a gift can lie dormant for a long time. And you don't see it. But if you keep focused on it, like the example I gave of, of our computer coordinator, focusing on what are you good at? And he found it, and now he's on his way to a job. And okay? he's on his way to a college degree. Um, we can lose sight of our gifts real quickly if you don't focus on them and pay attention. So at the exclusion of most everything else, if possible, we focus on people's potential to improve, what their potential is and how they can improve that and make it grow. Okay. Next is 
power of community. That everything significant that happens, happens with other people. Human beings are social entities, okay? Um, we live as community people. We don't do very well totally isolated, even though we have this American image of a totally independent person who needs no one. It's not possible. Okay? Think about where we would be if we didn't have even our clothes and our food and everything else. We're very interdependent. And as I said this morning, um, the thing that, that is in many ways most devastating about poverty and being disadvantaged is the isolation. It's that you're cut off from the mainstream. Uh, and I think that's the greatest injustice in it is having no sense of, of having no voice and no choice uh, in, in anything about your life. Okay? That you're just, just on your own and, and not connected. Okay? So as much as possible, we try to focus on how can we build that? How can we build cooperation and interdependence and, and working together? Um, everyone is included. There's no one excluded unless you know, the behavior is such that it just doesn't seem to work. And one person who had a great deal of difficulty in controlling her anger, and there were like eight very large incidents and, and things like that, so eventually she was um, But each time we stopped and looked at that and tried to work out ways to, to resolve it, but it was real clear that, that uh, the harder we worked, the more her tendency was to test, and it just it was, it was in one situation. But, and we spent probably 14 months dealing with that process. Because it was a real long-term thing. It was a very difficult thing for the group to make a decision to, to exclude someone. So, so everything we do is focused toward building a community. The fact that we, we share a meal together. Okay, that's the first thing you do when someone comes to visit you, is you offer them something to eat or something to drink. Okay, so, so we open ourselves in that way and try to, try to, to do that. Um, and try to be aware of anything that we may do that makes someone feel excluded. And little things that we can do in our own work, like sitting across your desk from someone, okay, makes them feel excluded. And in a way, this podium sets me aside, but it's the only way I can read my notes because my eyes can't see distances anymore. Um, so community needs to be fostered, needs to be, needs to grow and to improve. And let me just read a quote here. This is by Peter Gable. Having grown accustomed to a life deadened by bureaucratic work and family routines, to passing people on the street whose blank, blank gazes seem to indicate an inner absence, we each internalize the sense that in order to feel part of what little community there is in the world, we must deny our deepest needs and adjust to things as they are. And so we don our various social masks and become one of the others, in part by keeping others at the same distance we believe they are keeping us. In this way, social reality takes the form of a circle of collective denial through which each of us becomes both agent and victim of an infinitely rotating system of social alienation. Trapped in this alienation, people in the West are often unable to imagine themselves acting to change things, no matter how deeply they may desire a different kind of world. So in empowerment thinking, we try to stay out of those patterns continually focus on what's interfering with community and how we can build that, and how to keep people from feeling alienated and isolated. Any questions so far? And then the fourth basic principle of empowerment is the need for responsibility. Okay? That you have an effect on what's happening, and that it's up to you. Okay. If someone else is responsible, okay, someone sets up, sets up this task and says, I have to do this or else, and I don't do it, it's not my fault. It's their fault. Okay, they set it up. They said how it had to happen. Okay. Um, but when it's up to me, then I'm going to get some feedback on what I do. I'm going to find out if it works. And I'm going to be more inclined to figure out how to make it work and what to do about it. I remember when I uh, when I was in high school wrestling, I broke my arm, broke my elbow, and uh, I got the cast off just before the uh, the end of the season. And I said to the coach, you know, getting my cast off, maybe I can get back in time for the tournaments. But there was no way 
that I could have wrestled. The doctor said they don't even think about it. And it wasn't because my arm hadn't healed. The bone was completely healed. It was because it had been weakened so much, because it hadn't had any ability to respond or to move for that period of time. It had been held and supported by that cast. Okay? So when we pull someone up or help hold them or support them without an empowerment relationship underneath that and, and working with that, we weaken them. In much the same way as my arm was weakened as, as when I was in wrestling. And I've heard patrons say that uh, in these situations. And I've heard patrons say that they were angry at people who gave them things and, and helped them out in situations because they had it and, and the patron didn't. Okay? And they're angry at that. So, so the key is to have people be responsible to themselves to the extent that they're ready to handle it. Okay? If you give someone more responsibility than they're able to handle at that moment, you put them up for failure. Okay? So, so that's a constant balancing act to try to gauge how much responsibility someone can have. And invariably, people rise to the level of responsibility. Okay? We've had a number of situations where people have applied for, um, for coordinator positions or been elected as an elder, and our experience has been that these people might not have a lot to offer to that position. We're really concerned, are they set up for failure? But in every situation, they have come through. Okay, people who didn't seem to appear to have the, the skills or the experience to be able to do something and seemed like they were getting it over their head, invariably turned it around and worked something out. Okay? Because they were given that responsibility, and it was up to them. And if our coordinators don't get, get the job done, there's no one to pick it up. It has to, it has to be done to get it done. So they pick it up and they get it done. Okay. So the four overall principles that we focus on in terms of empowerment are the dignity of each person, the potential for improvement, the power of community, and the need for responsibility. Any questions about this? They're all, all have to be there together. Yeah, yeah they're together. Because I've seen that with the um, people that I work with. If those other things are there, then the need for responsibility starts to begin to happen. But it's almost like foundational, like you were saying, in the steps. Because if you don't have any of those, it doesn't work to give them responsibility because they don't, they don't feel right. And you can't build community or really treat someone with dignity without giving them responsibility either. So they are, they're yeah. intermeshed. If you do three of the four, you're not doing 75% of the job, you might be having more back in terms of the problem. And I know that's really the point. All four really need to be there. It's just like a, if a house is built on a foundation with three walls, it's, it's not going to hold up. It needs all four. And they do interrelate. Um, if, you, if you do these three things, treat them with dignity, build some community organization, and, and give them responsibility, but focus on their deficits and what's wrong with them and everything like that, you know. Where you didn't feel like you were treated with dignity. 
they didn't pay attention to your potential, um, where there wasn't any effort to build community and we didn't have any responsibility. And compare that to situations where you did have that. Okay, let's just have kind of a brief discussion about what this means in terms of people's experiences. Okay, because I think that's when we can integrate it. Um, when we think of those kinds of okay, so why don't we take about three or four minutes just to give you a chance to write that and you guys can reflect. Feel free to ask any of the elders or, or the patrons any questions that you may have in this process, too. Uh, but particularly, what I think would be helpful uh, is things that, that maybe aren't so obvious ways that this gets communicated. Okay? Um, you know, like Pat said, we do this ourselves sometimes. Okay? I mean, it's not like, like Hard Times Cafe is perfect in always doing this. There may be some ways that sometimes we don't really help to build someone's dignity. Yes. Um, I'll take all the suggestions I can. In, in my office, we tend to deny each other potential for improvement because we don't want to offend or criticize. And so we leave unsaid the, those things that should be dealt with. Can you help me to suggest a way where our staff can interact more honestly and still respect the dignity of all the people involved? If you want a simple and easy way, I can't. <laughs> um, the bottom line is is recognizing and believing that that's the best in the long run, and following through on it. The, the, just about every week, my inclination is not to say something about something or other, but when I do, I find that it ultimately gets cleared up. It, it, it can just fester and. I mean, I, I worked with a family once that had, had totally split apart for 12 years. And when they finally got back together, they couldn't remember what they had split up about. Okay? I mean, it, it just was yeah. that absurd, and that's not that uncommon. And our tendency is not to want to hurt anyone's feelings. We have this, this thing that, that we have to protect people. But actually, it winds up hurting more by not being up front. So if we simply clarify and go through those ABCs, okay, um, in terms of balance, uh, any time that you, you give any feedback that's not going to be welcome, it's going to be a whole lot easier if I'm in balance when I give the feedback and if I choose a time when that person is more likely to balance. If I catch them at the busiest part of their day or at the end of a really bad day, you know, I might get an explosion instead of a reception. Um, so, so taking that into account, okay, and then being real clear about how that will be helpful, okay? So focusing not on what's wrong, but on what's needed and what the potential is. If, not on what should happen, but if this happened, then this would be a lot easier, okay? And being real clear in our words in terms of when this happened, I felt this way, okay? Rather than you made me feel this way or you made me angry or you messed this up. Uh, when this happened in a neutral way, so it's not threatening, I felt or it was difficult for me, or I had a hard time when this happened. And actually, the saying I had a hard time can be clarified. What does that mean? I had a hard time. I don't mean anything. Okay. Um, I had to work an extra 10 minutes to fix this because of the way this was set up. Okay. And I can recognize that you were in a hurry and things like that. But next time, if you could do it, put it over here, it would save you. And, and in a sense, you answer to yourself by really focusing on the dignity of that person, okay? And believing that they will improve. Even if you have no evidence whatsoever that they're going to, believing that they will. Um, and, and you'll find those experiences as you, as you begin to believe that, where people really do follow through with that. Um, and being willing to take the flack when it comes back. Okay. To the extent that we get our ego out in front there and we're trying to protect it, we're going to work against empowerment. One of the steps that we're going to get to is, is humility, and it's a real critical one. Okay. That people are going to get angry at us and frustrated, and we can minimize that to the extent we're in a balance. We can anticipate that and prevent it, but it's still going to happen, and everyone is not going to like us all the time. 
but it's so, it's, so it's a commitment and a belief to a process. And it's the kind of thing that um, both directions it grows on itself. Okay, if you get this this pattern of secrecy and not bringing things out, it gets harder and harder to bring something out. And as you have a pattern of openness and dealing with things, it gets easier and easier to deal with things. So we just started that. Okay. Any comments from? Yes. I think that um, if. If you start a pattern of being honest um, with people, I have a friend, I have a neighbor who's always calling herself rude. Um, but when people, when she talks to people, some, sometimes, sometimes the thing she says is rude. I mean, you know, she'll say, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't invite you here today. It's a really bad day. Go home and close on your face. But because you expect her to be honest and because you expect her to say, what's in her heart, you also know that usually anything she says is being said for your good and her good. And you don't you don't take it as an insult. You take it as that's just the way she is and that's what you expect out of her. If you if you go up to to somebody and say very diplomatically, you know, I really don't want to hurt your feelings and I you know, I you you do great work, but, you know, they'll come to respect you for the honesty that you you know, they know that you're not you're not saying it to hurt their feelings, but you don't want them to make a fool of themselves in front of somebody, or, or you know, you really want them to get the promotion. Therefore, maybe this is what they should change. They they might be a little upset in the beginning, but I think in the long run they'll realize what it is that you're doing, and they'll even come to expect it from you. You know, when I want an honest opinion, I go to my neighbor because I know that she won't lie to me. It might hurt my feelings. You know, if I buy a dress and I spend a hundred dollars on it. I don't want to look like uh, you know little Miss Shirley Temple with all the frufus and, and lace. I want I want an honest opinion because I have to be seen in public. Opinions. And people won't always appreciate. It. I mean, people. It's, there's been a number of people come through the Hard Times Cafe who want special treatment, you know, for whatever reason, you know, any reasons, but they want to be treated differently or have some advantages that other people don't have. And we just. The easy thing to do would be say, okay, go we'll take care of it. We had an auction. We had an auction every year where the community donates a whole bunch of new items, to different stores and businesses, and the, the patrons can bid on with their hard times dollars. And um, the kids also have items that they can bid on with their fun times dollars. And we had this auction where an adult transferred his hard times dollars to the child, but we had to set the rule that hard times dollars and fun times dollars could mix because the total number of fun times dollars was like 100 or two, and there were Six or seven thousand hard times dollars, which is a totally different thing. So only kids could bid on kids' items who were only fun times dollars. So here was this child who bid on this bicycle that she wanted more than anything in the world and got it with hard times dollars. And we didn't realize she didn't have the fun times dollars to do it, so we had to say, the easy thing would say, oh, let her have it. Okay. But then that sends a message. Okay. So you got to bite the bullet and pay the price and say, I'm sorry, you can't have the bike. Okay. Someone in the community heard about that and called up a whole bunch of businesses and said, you know, we're denying bicycles to kids who earn them. And, you know, I mean, that happens. And I've been, I've had a number of people right in my face this far away shouting at me about things that, you know, that, I mean, basically I have to enforce what patrons decide. And if patrons decide you can get one package of product at the store, that's what I have to say. They come to me and say, I want food. Um, and people get really angry and sometimes they take it out of me. Uh, police report on me for assault and battery. So at a meeting, and there were 100 people at the meeting, and everyone saw that I you know, was the foundation of it all, but they have to investigate it. And, you know, it makes things difficult. It's not a, it's not a thing to get into if you want to make friends or run for political office. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a starting point for that. If you want to get into a parlor, you're going to catch some flack. At least as, as much as I know about it, that's just part of it. appreciating that necessarily. But on the other hand, you get that sense of respect from the larger group because they know that you're dealing with them strictly and that you're going to follow through on stuff. So you're, you're looking at the power of the community as a bigger goal than to keep one person happy. Okay? And a person who's very involved in, in 
the patrons had made a decision, someone donated a bunch of answering machines, and the patrons had made a decision you can only buy the answering machines with, we also have an investment program called Good Times Dollars, and it's, they can buy certificates of deposit and earn interest on them and things like that. Patrons simply decided you, have, you can only buy the answering machines with Good Times Dollars because they're not necessities, okay? The decision could have gone either way, but that's what they decided. Well, this person was an elder and had really done a lot and, and was a leader of the program and said, I need one of those answering machines and he didn't have <coughs> Sorry. He quit the program, okay? He's real anger, okay? He's never really gotten involved to the extent he was before. It would have been easy to say, well, go ahead, but then what does that set up in the future in terms of one person is treated this way? So it's difficult. There's no easy, easy road for that. Okay, are there any ways that, from your experience, anyone that wants to share with the, with the elders, that you had a sense where this was missing or what effect it had, or it was there and the effect it had? All the time that you were talking about principles and empowerment, um, I kept my I kept remembering this conversation that we had um, over a word when we were trying to come up with the the um, announcement for the first um, conference that we had in May, and that word was poor. Um, we had a, a real heavy discussion about instead of using the word disadvantaged, he was going to use the word poor for you know to describe us. Um, my reasons for not wanting the word poor being used is that when you when you say the word poor, it has a connotation. You know, pity the person. Um, the person needs, you know, something special, or there's something wrong with the with that person because you know, oh, poor this or poor that. Um, he had never thought of it that way because it had always been a commonly used word. Um, he discussed it with with a few other people in the program and get the same feedback. The word poor has the connotation of something bad. And the last thing we want is to be thought of as a bad person or, or a person that needs to be pitied or a person that needs special attention or help. We feel that we are the last person that needs that. We, we, we help ourselves. We do what we can to improve ourselves. Um, so we changed the word to disadvantaged, which I like much better because we are a disadvantaged people. Um, sometimes it's the disadvantage is small, you know, just we might need a little bit, bit more capital than we have. Sometimes it's it's um, education or you know clothing or housing or just an opportunity. It's something that I was doing for two and a half years and not even aware of. It's the dignity of the people that yeah. you're talking about. So, then we try to change it. I still use it occasionally, but I usually get reminded of And there's a lot of ways that are just totally unintentional. Okay? Things that we don't think about. And what happens is, is we're relating to the other person more in terms of our objective thinking rather than the subject. Okay? I just realized that these people are at a disadvantage because they're sitting in front of everyone and have to sit still this whole time and then all of a sudden there has to be on the spot. So it's, our interactions tend to be more spontaneous and when I turn and say, hey, now it's your turn, it's harder. So just plug in anywhere, okay, interrupt me. And I need this back, I'll move back further if I need to see it. Um, so catch me. <laughs> 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 yeah. That one from the camera, right? Oh. Yeah. That one I needed for responsibility. My personal experience, like, when I first come in, like, I don't, I don't know where everything is going on, but yeah. if you want to feel, I found out you don't really have to be educated through school. And I have not finished school, but I tell you, sometimes I get my head. But, I feel now, that being an elder, like, We've done a lot of things up in Harrison, but when you walk around the little hometown, like down here in Cut, people ask, well, we read a lot about you, but we never hear what you do. Sometimes we get that in your mind so much, you say, well, geez, 
never try to find out what I can do about it. Well, sometimes I have trouble talking to people out in the public, but I have trouble sometimes talking to people right here. But I just feel comfortable. I'm nervous, but that's the that point. But the thing of it is that I'm proud of myself. I go out in the public and talk to these people about getting vouchers and then getting transportation. I feel that need to be found at guarantee of helping these people down here as well as the person. If we could have a way to get them up there, I've been working on it. After we get them, hopefully if we get it started out, maybe we can get it big enough so we know what we're doing with them to help everybody. Because Clare County is just, it's a big territory. It's a couple more areas than what we can handle. My but I think but it made me feel good about talking to these people. At least they were sent there and listen about the gas auction. I didn't have all the answers. I felt bad about it at first, but I figured, well, that's what, what the rest of us are here for, too. If I can answer it, at least I can see them come up there. Talk to you better people as well, have a good dinner, enjoy themselves, and listen to what it's all about. Maybe they might find their own answers that they can find. But that's my personal experience about responsibility as far as the rest of it is concerned. Improve. I think I've done enough to improve myself. Sometimes when I'm at home, I say, well, sometimes some of the things I get into, I sort of lose. I don't know, I said, well, gee, everybody here for my own problems, but I gotta go out and take care of somebody else. So maybe that's why I feel too good, because I live my own. All I can tell you, well, I'm going to have a job, that's my problem now. And that's about where I get the willpower to do for the other people for myself. Any other comments? Well, I guess I gotta say a little something about improvement. Um, my husband's saying here has always been real quiet and shy until we became patrons of Hard Times Cafe. He's no longer quiet and shy. He has improved a lot. He, uh, I like to say he became mouthy, but it's not really mouthy, but he voices his opinion at the meetings and he never, never would speak to anybody until then. And they, they, have, they have done wonders for him. Yeah, our times. Well, it's just like two years ago, me and my wife were at a place and it closed down. And we had nothing else. I mean, we had uh, We had assistance. Little help. Was there anything else? Well, like uh, electricity and all that. We had no help. One of the areas we were living on is, is rummy cell stuff, uh, bottles, we could find them. And, they jump uh, stuff to the junkyard and get money. That's what we were living. And uh, I didn't know what else I could do because I'm illiterate and I can't read. I can read some, but not it still don't make sense to me. But just trying to make you were I was scared. What what I'm gonna do? And until hard times we start going to hard times, I thought this ain't me. Uh, more times I Hard time it was. And that's what we are. Like she said, I, I used to be real hot. Now she said I'm about <laughs> he, he would not. He surprised us uh, about six months ago in one of the meetings. He stood up and admitted that he had a reading problem. He, uh, we did. I did not know ahead of time that he was going to do that. That was the first time that he really admitted it to anyone in public. And I think hard times, if you guys are thinking about making a program like this, there's somewhere out there that some people will need it. Because there's people like me that didn't know where to go. And like we said, the governor, you know, took all that stuff away from us. We didn't know where to go. Because if you don't have the education, I'm a laborer. I'm not a uh, guy put something on the paper and now I can't read it. I'm a labor. And, and a lot of labor jobs aren't going away. And this is where a hard time, I think, I believe in hard times, it's in time, like we said, we're going to have a whole 
business and we're going to be our own, we finance our own programs that are worrying about uh, people who give us grants and all this. In time, we'll get that on our summary of the difference between kind of a service mentality, we know what you need, this is what you have to learn, versus an empower mentality, what are you interested in? How can we help you? Okay, that's a good point to point that out. Yeah. Yeah. To, just, to, just to say something to Dwayne, um, a lot of people associate your intelligence by how well you can do. And I think that is the um, lowest form of, of um, classifying a person. Um, being able to read or write does not mean thinking. I mean, they used to say that if, if you were deaf, you were dumb. It's it's the same with being literate. Um, just because you can't read um, a piece of paper that's in front of you doesn't mean that you don't understand what's being said to you. And um, I think doing is highly intelligent. He, he understands a lot more than um, some of the people that have the big educations and the letters behind their names, just because he, he listens instead of trying to categorize. We've had a discussion, I won't go into it because it's a real complicated process, but the system called Service from the Heart and it wasn't working. And um, we've been tinkering with it, with it for uh, probably six months, trying to figure out how to make it work. When he came up with a proposal at the last meeting, it looks like it's going to work and fix it. Okay. We had committees study it, we had the elders study it, and I've been ranking my brain, Gresham has been ranking my brain, when came up with a simple solution. It looks like it's going to work. It's not a question. Any other comments on 
the impact of those principles being present or absent? As you've been talking, um, and some of these folks talking too, you know, it seems that uh, the welfare reform package that Michigan is trying to implement uh, kind of misses the boat, you know, and most of the principles in the color. Um, you know, we're saying you know, you're going to, everybody's going to go out and get a job, and, you know, in, in essence, you've got two years to do so or something like that. That's, that's, that's kind of putting it in simple terms, but um, it kind of ignores you know, a, lot of these, a lot of these principles, you know. I think most of those things are developed politically what, based on what can sell, right, uh, based on any kind of principle or principle of speaking. And I think, unfortunately, the federal, the federal study in some detail also misses everybody into, into groups and categories. They are the worst when it comes to that. Um, we're all lazy and we all want ABC or we all want 15 children so that we can draw 15 times more than what we get as a single person. We all um, we all have to work first. You know, working working first will, will improve all of us or that's not necessarily the case. With me, I'm in school. Um, I will be graduating from the local college in Maine going on to save Mount Valley State for my bachelor's in social work. Um, if I would if I were to have gone to work, well I have worked off and on, but if, if I were to have just gone to work without ever thinking about going to school, I would still be working in a factory. Um, I'm not saying that my mind is the greatest in the world, but maybe you would have lost something in a few years that I could possibly give you that, or that I would have to offer. If I didn't go to school and get an education, I would be offering this to a factory, you know, how to improve the how to improve the factory line. Just assign me a factory at work if that's the case, because that's what you're doing by doing work first and lumping us all together. The other comments about these four basic principles and then the rest of the time is gonna be to support these. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say though, these things certainly I can see where I work. Uh, beginning of when I started working there and now how they can, uh, how those principles really came into play and did make uh, quite a bit of an impact and um, I don't know if you want to go into that you know but yeah, I just sure. uh, I think um, one thing was that I really felt like I was in a gun hole go in there and change the world you know I was going to make my impact in the world and I think uh, when I went into this programming, um, I didn't include the, the uh, community's input, number one, so I was denying them dignity without realizing that I was, because what, I just wanted to change the world, you know. So I think um, that really plays a big part. Uh, for example, I was going, I was telling uh, Kim, is it, that I was trying to plan a uh, community fair, and I never asked the members if they wanted to have a fair. You know, I just decided this is going to be fun for them, and this is going to be something that is going to involve them, give them responsibility, give them self-esteem, all those good things. However, it didn't even involve them. We had them sign up for all these different uh, activities at the fair, and no one showed up for the activities to run the program, to run any of the games. And now that I'm having a, what we call a member discussion, once a month we have all the members that are free or willing to come have a free lunch and we talk about what we want to do with the program, where we want to go with it. Now I have about four or five women that are planning a harvest party, which they're all involved in. They're excited about all because really those because they're now, it's their 
suggestions. It's their responsibility. And, and I can really see how that does come into play. All those things. Okay. Uh, it's quarter to three. How about if we take about a ten minute break and then we'll try to get through uh, a couple of sets of the steps. What I'd like to do for the rest of the day, just to kind of give you a picture of where we're going. Um, I want to start on the bottom parts of this and focus on the, the role of helpers and becoming an effective helper and tomorrow we can look at the, the process and conditions for improved. Any other comments or questions? Or we've got a couple of people here to come back. There was a question about um, using our materials and model and the fact that it's copyrighted. Uh, the only reason it's copyrighted is just to make sure that it's clear and that someone doesn't sell it to someone else. Uh, feel free to use the materials in your own setting and if you want, you know, any of the other forms that we have, you know, like our work site evaluation form or our coordinator evaluation form or any of that other stuff. Uh, we're happy to share that. We just ask that you don't sell it or if someone else wants it, that you ask them to contact us so we make sure that it's, it's uh, because it's easy to get it diluted, and so can change it and say, can we find something that's from Hard Times Cafe that's been changed four or five times over and may evolve in a different way than we do. So just if our name is on, appreciate that, that it comes from us. But there's no charge or fee or anything like that for using any of the material. We just hope that it, that it does get used. We have um, had quite a, a considerable discussion about uh, replication in terms of other counties opening hard times cafes and um, the bottom line is right now we just don't have time to formally support that. Um, informally we can and we'll try to send some patrons. Uh, I may be available at certain times to, to come and consult with people and, and do that. Uh, but in terms of formally what our board decided was just simply not to call any other programs hard times cafes so that makes us responsible for them are obligated to, to help them out, and we just don't have the resources at this time. So we're kind of struggling to keep doing it ourselves in terms of our financing and staff time and things like that. Um, so we can't uh, really get into any kind of process or, or setting up hard times campaigns along the state, which is what we'd like to do. But if anyone wants to open a similar program, you can use exactly what we're doing and make it fit your needs and we'll go wherever you, you know, feel it, it works best in your community, and we'll support you. Give you feedback and things like that. Maybe in a year or so we will have worked out a process. We can open and we'll call for text cafes and try to work on some joint funding arrangements. We just became clear we have the resources to do that. Any other questions from where we are so far? Uh, pretty much we've gone through the, the ABCs and the, and the four basic principles, and now we're getting into the, the sets of steps and um, I think the place to start with that, and in the past I've, uh, I've gone through the conditions for improvement and the process of improvement and pretty much taken these in the order that they're written here, but the more I reflected on it and uh, trying to prepare for this day, uh, the clearer it became that the, the essence of empowerment is in the relationship and that you can go through all of the steps and have the systems and the forms and all of that. But if you don't have an empowering relationship, it's not going to have the effect of helping someone to empower themselves. Um, so we decided to shift it around and switch and focus on what is the role of helpers in an empowerment philosophy? Uh, and what are the steps that we need to go through? And again, that um, each step builds on the other. Okay? Without acceptance, all of these are going to if all you're going to do is challenge someone saying, okay, we're going to take, off, we're going to take all your benefits, and you go out and do it, and you don't do any of these other things, it's pretty hard to call yourself a help. Okay? And really, these other steps are really critical. This is also critical, but then each step builds on the other. If you don't have the steps underneath it, it's better to focus on those first rather than trying to look. So rather than trying to join with someone in terms of solidarity and, and change the system or do something like that, Maybe the place to start is to make sure that they feel accepted and that you're accepting where they are and what their needs are and what they need to them. Okay, so the, the bottom steps really are the, the 
most critical. And I talked about acceptance at some length in terms of the ABCs, and that also appears in another place in the model. It's a real critical concept in terms of empowerment. It just simply can't happen uh, without acceptance. Um, every time we help someone, there's a potential that we can diminish them, that we can help them also to feel unaccepted, that we can, in a sense, communicate something that, that, that puts them down. So acceptance is really focusing on that part of each person that, that can improve and paying attention to that. And there's a way that we start um, every single meeting of the Hard Times Cafe that I haven't told you about, and I'd like to do it right now um, to give you a sense of what it's about and also help us get through the afternoon. It's um, but we choose to focus on the part of each person that's acceptable. Okay? And the way I often describe it is we focus on the beauty in every person. And every single person has something within them that is really beautiful. It's something that we all share and have in common. That our essential humanness is good and positive and beautiful. But there is no such thing as an evil person. If you look at even someone like uh, Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler, you can look at their background and see how their reactions have formed a pattern. They're reacting to things in their defenses. And, and ultimately, you know, Saddam Hussein is just like all of the rest of us. He wants to be loved. So he's thinking that the way to get love is by controlling people and you can ensure that they love you or else you get your ear cut off um, or your hand or whatever else he cuts off these days. Um, that's true. He cut off your ear. But that's essentially what we all want and need and, and what we struggle and do all kinds of things. We try to get all kinds of money and all kinds of power and all kinds of things, essentially, so that we feel loved and appreciated. Because none of us has enough a sense of appreciation or, or being loved for who we are. Okay? So we start out every meeting by giving each other some standing, a, a standing ovation that shows that appreciation. Now, we've got a small group, so you're going to really have to, to dig into your socks to get some energy to show the level of appreciation that you deserve. Because I want you to think about the work that you do and the struggles that you have. There's two parts to this that we look at. We look at the beauty in each person, their potential, their essential humanness. Okay, it really deserves to, to blossom and to grow. And we also look at the pain and suffering and what we've endured. And that gives us a context for understanding our, our difficulty and how we're disadvantaged. Okay? So take a moment and think about those two parts to yourself. And then when I count to three, I want a rip-roaring standing ovation that matches the amount of appreciation you deserve for who you are. Okay? Now, this is not an example of what to do. You don't just kind of sit there and stand up and say, because that's not what you're worth. If you really look at it, if you look at it seriously and honestly, and look at yourself and everyone else here, that we all have that essential word. So this needs to be high energy. So that means you gotta, you got to move your chair back a little bit. you got to make sure there's no cups or anything around. Make sure you have enough elbow room. Okay? And then you can do it all at once and everybody at the same time. When I come. Okay? Is everybody ready? Is there anyone who's not ready? Just hurry up and sit down and do what everyone else does. <laughs> okay? Trust me. Give yourself a little bit of room. Is everyone ready now? Okay? One, two, three! where they are, but where they are right now 
And it really, the key to acceptance is putting yourself in their shoes and trying to see the world as they see it. Okay? And staying there until that makes sense. Okay, you don't have to agree with it, but you stay there until you can see how it makes sense to them, given their conditions and experiences, their stress levels, their mood, all kinds of other things. And yeah, I can see how you feel that way, or I can see how you think that way. But if you could say to someone, I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me, I don't see how you can feel that way or think that way at all, you can't really be in a healthy world. To the extent you say that, you're missing out on them. You can't, you can't relate to them. And when we relate in that way, human to human, it changes us. Okay, just like, still got it here. This lukewarm water and coffee is now changed. We become changed when we really accept another person and to relate with them. So we have to be open to do that, uh, which, is, which is in the next uh, set of steps. Um, and when, as I said, when someone doesn't feel accepted, they put up a wall or they put on a mask. Okay, and you relate to that mask or that wall and you don't have the human to human contact. And they'll tell you what you want to hear, and you think things are great, wonderful, and fine, but nothing's really happening in terms of the power. Uh, so acceptance is human to human. And you can't treat everyone the same way. Parents can't even do that. You try it with their kids, and it just doesn't work. You can't be fair in that sense of treat everyone the same way. You treat people according to the decisions that have been made and the principles that have been established, but every person is unique and different. So you, how you relate needs to adjust to that if you're truly accepting someone. And a real key is accepting emotions. And I, I somehow got uh, moved away from that when I was going through this mind, mind body emotions. But let me just explain real briefly what emotions are so we understand them. Because there's so much misunderstanding about that, even within my own profession. Um, emotions are simply reactions. And they're physical events. It actually happen in your body. We think of an emotion as a mental thing. We even call it mental health when we work with emotions. But emotions are actually physical. You can measure them in your body. Okay? There are movements in the muscles. When you experience an emotion, there are movements in the muscles that you can measure if you look someone up there and put there's no value in doing that, but you can prove that emotions exist physically by doing that. Okay? And they're simply reactions. They are not necessarily logical. They don't pass through the logical, reasonable part of your brain, the cortex in the front. They're regulated by another part of your brain that's much deeper and more primitive and further back. Animals have emotions too, and they don't use logic. The chickens have emotions, which can be afraid of. They get angry. Mothers, I've got some other hens that catch a bunch of little chicks, and the chicks get out of the coop, and I try to catch them, and when I go back to put them in, the mother's angry and flying in because they think I'm trying to hurt the chicks. Animals have emotions too. They're simply reactions to what we perceive. Okay? And the nature of emotions is they move. It's right in the word. Emotion. Okay? They move and they're gone. Unless something happens to keep them going. Okay? But we experience them within us. So we think they're very personal. And we tend to identify with them. And if someone denies what I'm feeling, it feels like they're denying me. If they say, you shouldn't feel that way, it feels like it diminishes me. And I don't feel accepted if my emotions are accepted. The bottom line, emotions are just physical human reactions to what we perceive. Now, they may be reactions to what we think. Okay, I mean, you can think about something that um, made you angry and you become angry again. You can think about something that made you sad and become sad again. Okay, and that's a way of what I call recycling emotions. You can just keep them going by thinking about them all the time. You get really stuck in them. The problem with emotions is when we don't accept them. If an emotion is, is not acceptable, our tendency is to try not to feel it. If we somehow get a message that we shouldn't feel that or that, that emotion is not acceptable, we try to stop it. And the way we do that is by tensing the muscles. Okay, think of a little kid where the father says, big boys don't cry. Okay, what does he do? He goes, <laughs> tenses his chest, tenses his throat, closes his jaw, holds his breath, stops crying stops feeling, okay, because tension is the muscles holding, and the muscles need to move for the emotion to be experienced, so you can stop the emotion by tensing, okay, so anytime you don't accept what someone's feeling, you're creating tension, and that create, that tension 
is an integral part of the stress response and is basically the body's response to stress. The way the body responds to stress is it builds up tension in the muscles to give us the energy to, to deal with the situation on an animal level, which means to fight or to run away. It's called the fight or flight response. Okay? So holding in the emotions has the same effect as putting stress on them, so not accepting the emotions. Okay? If we remember that emotions are just simple natural events, we don't have to explain them. Why are you feeling that? It's a stupid question. Okay, Because you don't have to say why. It's just what you're feeling. I'm feeling because that's what my body responds. Emotions don't have to make sense. We can make connections. You know, my dog died and I feel sad. But we don't have to make those connections. And there are many situations where emotions don't make any sense at all. Okay. A real common one is, you know, I worked with a woman who was married for... 65 years, her husband died in a very close, very loving relationship, um, and she was angry at him. She hardly ever got angry at him when they were alive in the last 20 years of marriage, she was angry after he died. It didn't make any sense. And I can hunt for an explanation or say she's angry because he left and all of that stuff, but I don't have to. The bottom line is she felt the anger, she let go of it, and it was done. Okay, now if we start picking apart and saying, well, why are we angry? Because we can find probably 30 reasons and keep her angry for the rest of her life. But the key is, is emotions just simply move. If we experience them, they move. We let them go. Okay? Try to stop a storm sometime. Okay? I mean, you can put up a wall and do all kinds of things, but the storm is going to continue to go. What you do is you ride out the storm. You ride out the emotions. You accept them, and you let them move. That's their nature. And accepting an emotion doesn't mean you have to express it. It doesn't mean, okay, now you've got to talk about this feeling. Okay? Sometimes talking about a feeling helps to clarify it, but other times talking about it recycles it, just keeps the emotion going over again. If you simply accept it, don't do anything to stop it, it goes away on its own. Okay? So that's the nature of emotions, and then kind of back to that principle of balance and how all these are interrelated. Okay, when we get out of balance and we get stressed out, what happens to our emotions is we become what I call sunburned. Okay, we become reactive. Okay, let's say I slept my face in. <laughs> leg, okay? And it stings a little bit. Actually, my hand stings even more. But imagine if I was badly sunburned. Okay? If I had been down in Florida or something and laying out in the sun for two weeks and just came back, you could just touch my leg like that and they'd hear me on the parking lot. Okay? That's what happens to our emotions. If we've got this tension built up, either from stress or from not accepting the emotion, it's bigger and it's more reactive. Okay? If we simply accept them and let them move, then they go on. But again, don't forget that emotions are personalized. Somehow we connect them with who we are. And if our emotions are denied, then we get our sense of self feels like we're not. And it's true, because that tension diminishes our sense of self. It diminishes our aliveness. And what happens when people won't experience emotions is they become depressed. And their body literally shuts down. Their, their, their um, parasympathetic nervous system takes over and they don't have any energy to their muscles at all. So their muscles don't move and they don't get any reaction. And that's what happens in a depressed person. This is the stance of a depressed person. No energy. The energy is, gets held so much that the body just shifts into another gear over to another part of the nervous system and doesn't even have anything to do with it. Any questions or comments about acceptance? It's the bottom line. Without that, if someone doesn't feel accepted, it's really hard to be helped in, a, in an enduring way in an empowering way. If you throw someone $5, and you might help them in a brief way of $5 a month, but in terms of communicating acceptance and, and, and really helping them in a long term and empowering them, nothing really happens. Okay, respect takes acceptance a step higher and deeper. Respect is something that we think of as being earned, but it means to value and appreciate. Acceptance is, is kind of, this is the way you are, and that's okay. Okay, respect takes that and says, I value it, you, and I appreciate it. Okay, and it's something that, again, we can choose to do. Okay, if we wait for people to earn our respect, okay, we put them in a one-down position in ourselves in a one-up position. But if we choose to respect someone and find the part of them that's respectable, that's valued, that's worthy of value and appreciation, they find it themselves. 
okay? And other people find it and see it. Just like with Dwayne, who started speaking up in meetings, and then people realized he had good things to say, so they elect him as an elder to show their value and their appreciation for what he has to offer. Uh, and he has now earned that respect, but he had that respect before he said a word, because people respected him for who he is, just like they wanted every other person to patron of the program to give him the respect for who they are. But these gifts are hidden, but they're not up to you to see. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to know that the very first step of acceptance, uh, a lot of people that you are dealing with are very hostile, and they're very angry. Not necessarily you, but you see that anger coming out, and you tend to personalize the anger as being something that you did. Or, and it's very hard to separate their hostility for whatever from yourself, because it's about firing you. My question is, how do you... Uh, allow them to ride the emotion. I mean, you get involved in, in emotions, period, because they're coming at you with hostility, and then you're trying not to take that hostility, but there's a lot of dialogue with the, uh, you know, everybody tensing up, and if you're going to empower them, how are you going to empower them? I mean, You've got to be in balance, okay? I mean, before every meeting, I go off into a little chapel or a church board meeting, and I have, I try to be quiet where I just shut down and let go and get into balance, okay? So that I can I can respond to the situation and not out of my own tension. I try to let go of that tension, okay? And I try to, uh, um, you know, we, we have a staff meeting uh, sometimes at 11.30 or 12.30, and then sometimes we have a coordinator's meeting and then an hour's meeting, a hard time cafe meeting. And I found out that that didn't work. I need some time between the staff meeting and the coordinator's meeting and the hour's meeting where I can get back into balance again. If I work all day, um, I'm not going to be able to do that as well as if I can take an hour before one of those meetings and get back into balance. Okay? And, and you know, there are ways to do that that we can become more efficient and really go quickly. Um, like tomorrow, I'm kind of setting myself up because we're going to be here until 2 and we've got to be here at 30, so I'm probably not going to go for the first hour of the hours here. Okay? So then I can do some balancing things and take the time off. Okay? And, and be able to respond to that. Because if I'm tense, I'm going to lock into their anger. And, and I can't help but not react to it. Okay? So if I'm in balance, it's a whole lot easier. Then the next step is, is clarifying will help you to accept. Clarifying that they're reacting to their history and their perceptions and how they see things. Okay? Um, there was a situation where we had a limited supply of toilet paper and toilet paper is a high priority item in the store, um, and one person bought it all up. Okay, and the volunteer said, well, you can't do this. You can take one package because everybody else wants some. And so he comes and gets in my face and is screaming at me this far away, you know, that, that I'm not treating him with dignity and, and you know, I'm telling him what he can't do. Um, so what I'm trying to look at there is to understand his pain and that He's feeling, and I'm just guessing, okay, this is what I'm going through in my own mind. He's feeling cheated and shortchanged, and <clears throat> that he can't get what he needs, okay? And there probably are valid experiences in his background that set him up and made him sunburn for that. But anytime someone's that angry, okay, I'm looking for sunburn, okay, and trying to get a sense of how they're being reactive and, and what's going on, okay? And so I will, well, what I said to him is I can appreciate you're really angry. It's real frustrating. You know, it's there, and then he's, you know, we never said that ahead of time. We, we set the rule after the fact. Okay, we never said ahead of time one role for, we didn't anticipate it being a problem, but I didn't say that to him. But we didn't set it ahead of time. You know? And this was early in the process, and now that's been an ongoing rule of never showing up the store. Um, but acknowledging his anger, okay, and, and, giving him the right to have that anger, okay? And, you know, he stormed out and got really, you know, had a big scene and all that, and I followed him off and got in my face, and, and we talked about it and dealt with it, and he left, and the next meeting he came back, and he apologized in front of the whole group. He had some time to think about it, okay? But he had to, that feeling had to be accepted. I mean, if I would have jumped on him and said, that kind of shouting is not going to tolerate me. He's not going to talk to me that way. Look what I'm doing for this boy. But it runs its course. Okay? He blew it off. It's tension, 
if it's built up, and if it moves, it will go if you're not doing anything to recycle it. Okay, now there may be a whole lot of tension to build up, and it can take a long time. You don't have to stay with it the whole time, but you communicate that it's acceptable, that the feeling is acceptable. Okay? And, and the key is not to be hooked by that, to allow someone to be angry and not personalize it. Okay? That I choose what I'm going to perceive, and I'm going to be looking for Sunday. Okay? I'm also going to look at myself afterwards. I won't at that moment necessarily, because it's going to take a lot of concentration to deal with that. But I'm going to look at my role in that and I'm going to question, you know, is there something I did? In that situation, you know, if I'd been really thinking, I would have anticipated that and saying, you know, we've only got eight rolls of toilet paper, you know, and we've got 30 people who want it, okay, and so I really can have one roll. We want to pull out the package and it's 32 rolls or something early, okay? So and then I can apologize to him for that, which again is communicating some respect and acceptance, okay? I can choose to perceive this as, this guy is a troublemaker. Okay? He had a reputation as a troublemaker. Okay? Um, in school and throughout the whole thing. We have a long history of that. Okay? There's one choice of how to perceive it. But our focus is on what his potential is. Okay? And if I can find a place to apologize, I will. Okay? And that's that's another thing that you need balance and time to do, which is always too short in our situation. But to the extent that you have that, that makes sense. Yeah, in my mind, um, there are other things that you have to do. I mean, and, and you can have somebody coming at you at a time when you're stressed out. What do you say to them? This anchor and hold. Well, <laughs> so I might say that. Time out here. <laughs> I might say that. I'm saying, you know, I'm really stressed out right now, and I don't think I can respond very well to this. Come talk to me in 10 minutes, because I don't want to say anything. Or after the fact, I might have to say that, you know, when you came in, you didn't know where I was at, but I was really stressed out, and I said some things that, that weren't very nice. Okay, and I apologize for that, because I was stressed out. I was just suffering and suffering. So being up front about that clears it up. So it's not like just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. Um, but I think the principle of balance is, is so critical that in any helping profession, um, we have to pay attention to it. And if we're in a job that doesn't allow us to do that, um, then we can't really do our job. Something has to really have to look at that. Someone has to be aware of that. Because the more we're pushed, the less likely we can respond in a helpful way. And then why are we there? We can't respond in a helpful way. Does it come with you? What does it matter? We keep our funding together. Okay, and respect implies trust, and trust is a decision. Okay, we can decide to trust someone even if we don't have evidence that up until that point they deserve that trust or, or earned that trust. Okay, and trust builds confidence, and confidence leads to improvement. Okay, so choosing to respect keeps that process moving, and it's something that again we continually need to focus on and work on. And in balance in order to do that. And then the third step is to listen. Um, there's a children's story that I read many years ago that I really loved, but it talked about a little boy who was listening to another little boy's problems, and it said, he listened from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes. Okay? So that means listening not just with your ears and with your head, but listening with your heart, and listening with your experience, and getting a sense of what that feels like for that person. And in order to do that, we have to give our complete attention. Okay, and our tendency, if, particularly if we're out of balance, is to be thinking about our response rather than listening. We want to create a category, and this is this, and so I'm going to do this, and we're going to finish the story, and then we do this. Okay, now I have specialized in working with anxiety. I've worked with probably thousands of people who have stress and anxiety disorders. Um, and I hear the similar kinds of situations again and again and again and again. Okay? Um, every single time that I say to myself, this is what I'm going to say or do before I've heard their whole story, I miss it. I screw up. I miss the boat. They don't improve. It just drops out. Okay? I've learned to flag that and catch it, even if I've heard the same thing for the 47th time, 
there's something unique in here that I need to listen to and, and pay attention to and, and respect and focus on. And then things move. Okay. Even if I wind up saying the same thing that I thought I was going to say before, it's different because they feel heard. They feel listened to. And if you don't feel listened to, you don't feel respected, you don't feel accepted, you don't feel that your dignity uh, means anything to the other person. Um, so we can't anticipate what they're going to say or make it be real quick on a, on a category. Okay, we have to be truly present with them. That also means you can't be in a hurry. Okay? It means, it means to take the time. Better to have a two or three minute conversation with someone and give them your full presence uh, than to have a five or a six minute one and be in a hurry. And I have a lot of two and three minute conversations with patrons. There's a lot of problem solving that goes on and a lot of two and three minute counseling sessions, particularly when there's a problem situation. But it's basically listening and validating the feelings and searching for an option and clarifying what's important to them and searching for an option. And you can get so that you can do that in a couple of minutes and be a little bit helpful. Not that you completely resolve everything and life is wonderful, uh, that takes an hour. <laughs> but, but you can have an impact okay, in that time. But the bottom line is you first have to listen and be present to them. Listen to their feelings, listen to their needs, listen to their concerns. Also, listen for their strengths and listen for opportunities. Okay? Listen for opportunities where we can encourage and inspire them. And everyone has strengths the extent that we can listen for those strengths and pay close attention to them, we find them. Okay? So it enlarges our perspective. We see more of the picture. It deepens our understanding. Okay? And it sets the direction for our response and, and what we're going to do about it. So without that listening, we set the direction based on something else, based on something maybe we learned in school or someone else taught us. But this way we're setting the direction based on the person's needs thoughts and ideas and strengths, and so that helps to recall. Okay, when we accept, respect, and listen, we begin to understand. Okay, we can't understand from a distance. We've got to have a relationship to understand. Okay? Understanding is very different than information or knowledge. Understanding comes from experience. So even if I have never had any trouble reading, okay, if I want to understand that, I can imagine myself. All I have to do is take any day in my life and imagine what it would be like not being able to read and how much that would cost me. Okay? And even then, I have to recognize that I don't fully understand. Okay? Just like you can't not ride a bike get on a bike, you can't remember what it's like to not be able to ride it. You can't duplicate that learning process. Um, just like you can't not understand English. Um, you can't choose to not understand the words that I'm saying. Okay? If I speak another language, you can not understand that. Um, I speak Dutch, and I was in Holland, and I, and then I was in a, I got a ticket, a parking ticket. I was trying to be a tourist, get out of it. But I could not understand what they were saying. I wound up answering their question when they were talking about what was going on. Um, it comes from experience. Okay? It comes from either imagining yourself in that situation um, or relating it to something in your own experience that's happened to you. Okay? It, it's a receptive process. You can't hurry up and understand. You can't push yourself to understand. You can't understand it under pressure. Okay? It's a receptive thing. And understanding is a process. It's not like taking a little snapshot. Okay? You can take a snapshot, and that's what they do in, in uh, television advertising and commercials, is they take snapshots and they work with this whole concept of, of uh, categories and, and the big funnels, and they give you a snapshot and say, this is the way it is. Okay? And you can distort just about anything with a snapshot. I can take a picture of any one of you within the next two minutes and make it look like you're sleeping because you're all blinking your eyes. Okay, because it's a normal, natural thing. You take a picture of you and say, ah, she's asleep. Okay, she paid her money for the conference and she's asleep. Look at this guy, he's sleeping. Okay, 
state employee, here he is sleeping. Okay, we're paying him to go to this thing, putting him up, and here he is sleeping. Okay, get him in all kinds of trouble, and we caught him bleeding. Okay, a snapshot can isolate. So we have to look on both ends of it, we're going to understand. We have to look at the context and the situation and where it's heading and what's going on. So we have to let go of our preconceptions in order to understand another person. We have to let go of the categories that we put them in, or our tendency to put them in. I worked with a man once who had been in seclusion for 30 years. He had been in a room with concrete walls and an iron door for 30 years, the same room. And he'd been in restraints in a straitjacket for three years continuously. Now this was in the mid-70s. And at that time, the Department of Mental Health came up with a new mental health code, and in Michigan, it became against the law to keep someone tied up 24 hours a day, which is this kind of stuff. So they said, you can't do this anymore. And so the, the institution where I was living had set him up to the place where I happened to be working because we had a small psychiatric unit, and they said, you got to fix him. Because every time they let him go, which was only once a week to give him a shower, they just fed him. They kept him tied up and just went in and fed him. Uh, but whenever they let him go, he just went wild. You know, they taught us how to, how to deal with someone who's swinging with one hand and swinging with the other hand and kicking with one foot. But they didn't teach you what to do when someone was coming at you with everything, elbows and kicking the head and everything. And this guy just went wild. He was 42 years old and he just started when he was 12. And they just kept him in seclusion the whole time. And, uh, and that's what they did. Okay. In the process of bringing him into our building, uh, there was a row of windows at this, about this height. And we had four of our biggest, strongest uh, staff walking with him. And this guy was small. He was about this tall and real wiry. And he put out three of those windows with his foot. Okay. He was pretty incredibly strong, and I've never seen so much tension in that person in my life. And I didn't work on that unit. I was assigned to a different one, but I had, had an awful lot of experience in working with violent and aggressive people. So they asked me to check this guy out and see what I could do. And there was kind of a crowd around the, the room see what was happening because it was a really interesting situation. Plus people want to see what, you know, see me get clobbered for the first time. Um, but I, of course, did some balancing things first because the last thing you want to do is approach that situation with tension and have any choice in that at all. And then I just opened the door and they put him in an in a old seclusion room that they used for storage. And, uh, but they uh, they didn't have a lock. They didn't know where else to do it. They had staff by it so they couldn't get out. Um, but they didn't know where else to put him. So I walked in the door and approached him the same way that I did everyone when I was out of control, it was just in this position. Okay, and my knees are bent, and I'll explain that later why, why that. And my arms are like this, and basically it's it's just a passive position. I can't throw a punch in this position. He taught us to go in like this, which doesn't make any sense, because we're doing something like this. Yeah. You know, but in this position, I can move for him. Anyway, so I just started talking to him, and I made sure I was closer to the door than he was to me, so I could jump out real quick, you know, so we could climb him. Because um, that's not going to be helpful.